Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the invitation here to be among mathematicians is really very interesting. Um, so I'm a physicist, uh, but I love mathematics, um, especially when it allows me to write a physical law. <laughs> but also, um, like you said this morning, I think uh, mathematics and physics can help to challenge biological dogma about how biology works. So I think, um, so I really um, um, love uh, to be here. Um, so m maybe my title was not very um, explicit, so I added a biomimetic approach to study cell functions. So what we do here uh, is that we reproduce cell functions uh, with using uh, purified proteins and purified lipids, um, and we try to mimic cell function to understand them in simplified conditions. So I should say that I do a little bit of chemistry uh, because we do a lot of biochemistry. So I am in between uh, physics, uh, mathematics, and chemistry. Right, so uh, to take um, after Schalke this morning, who um, showed you this movie, I won't show it again. It's a neutral, neutral file that's, um, that's moving, that's scrolling. In fact, um, you know this sperm cell. Uh, this is a human sperm cell. It, it uh, moves by beating its flagellum. And um, so these are two completely different ways of, of moving. This one um, uses an external beating for moving, and this one uses internal reorganization of these filaments. And this is what I will study here. And to put, you, put this um, in a perspective of ev evolution, in fact, a long time ago, we used to be unicellular prokaryotic cells, and we used to move with flagella, but, um, and then we became eukaryotic cells, so with a nucleus. Um, and then when we started to develop into tissues, we needed to enter this flagellum inside the cell to be able to have the cell move with internal movements, and we didn't have space to to, to put a flagellum. Right, so this is why we're made of eukaryotic cells that reorganize their cytoskeleton all the time. So here is a, um, cell motility um, in, in three steps as it was uh, predicted by Abercrombie just before he died, in fact. Um, uh, and so you have in green here the actin that we heard about this morning already. And uh, you see it, it, it develops a lamellipodium here. This lamellipodium, this actin filaments are able to push the membrane forward. Then it attaches to the substrate. And then the third step is the retraction of the cortex that we heard about this morning. So in this talk, I will uh, concentrate on this network. So it's a network of filaments, of uh, semi-flexible filaments. Um, I will come to um, how it's arranged in a minute. So, in fact, the cortex is also um, a network of filaments that's contracting, but um, in this talk, I won't talk about contraction by myosin motors. So I'll, I'll concentrate on how the membrane can be deformed by actin polymerization. So, in fact, actin, actin polymerization is also used for endosomes to move inside the cell. And as, as I will show you, it's... Um, I mean, it's a very powerful mechanism. Actin-based motility or actin polymerization into a filament or a network is a very powerful movement for, I mean, motion, origin of motion for the cell. So this is a summary of uh, how a cell is, what, what the cell is made of. So you see this is a cell that develops philopodia. We heard about this this morning. It, it has a nucleus here. I'll come to the nucleus um, at the last slide of, the, of this talk. But you see that the actin filaments are organized in very different ways here. So here, for example, you have parallel 
filaments. Um, the actin filaments grow from here, and then they push the membrane forward, just all parallel. They are cross-linked by other proteins. So what is in yellow is the new actin monomers. As was said this morning, new actin monomers polymerize here, and they are able to push it forward. There's another mechanism I will talk um, very generously about is the branching mechanism. So there is a protein that's able to make a new branch of actin at the side of the filament. There is also contracting mechanisms um, and more complex mechanisms I, I won't talk about. So in fact, um, the um, this structure of actin filaments gives the cell very surprising properties. So it's an active material. Uh, we saw this morning again that we we can model it with. Um, I think it was in Annie's talk. We can modeling with model it with an elastic as an elastic material as a viscous material. This is a dash pot, and we have an active term because we have some motors or some polymerization that's able to to. Um, to activate some force. So the, so the whole thing is to understand how we link the biochemistry to the mechanical properties of the cell. Right, so this branching mechanism, this is a textbook view. Uh, when it was discovered, um, so forget about the membrane here. Just look at the uh, branching mechanism here. So uh, actin monomers are in blue. Um, the ADP, of course we need ATP in the cell for it to work. So ADP actin monomers are in dark blue. Um, light blue are new ATP monomers. And as you see here, through the use of this um, complex that's called the ARP23 complex, so it, it binds to the side and then a new filament is able to grow. So we will, we will challenge a bit this model here, but what's important here is that you have a bench of proteins that regulate this. So if you, um, so in fact what happens here is that you, you have a sort of a live polymerizing filament that is able to, to push, but you have other protein that has, are, are called capping proteins that cap the filaments. So as soon as you make a branch, the branch will be, uh, after a while, the branch will be capped by a filament, so this thing can't grow forever. Otherwise, we would have an exponential growth. So it, it just, after a certain scale, uh, uh, length, it, it stops growing just by the addition of capping protein. Right, so we will um, challenge this model of pushing, uh, but this is how the uh, network uh, develops. So in fact, the, the way uh, this network develops was deciphered by the lab of Laurent Blanchoin uh, 10 years ago. Here what he does, he uses, uh, he uses activated, activated fibers that are able to recruit an up to three complex. So in fact, you have to, to have a branch, you need to have a pre-existing filament. So here you see this, um, it's a fiber that's coated with the activator, and you see these branches that grow. So if, you, if I remove my, my dashed line here, you see a filament that grows here. It's not connected to the fiber, but as soon as it, as soon as it connects to the fiber, you have a new branch that forms, right? So it's the branch, it's the filament that touches the activated, um, a fiber that is able to make a new branch. So you have a branching like this. Um, um, it goes on, so on and so forth. So in fact, what happens is that, um, so when you have the filament that, that recruits um, this complex, then you have a branch that forms. Um, then the ca capping protein caps the, the branch. And then you, after a while, you have a, what I call a dead zone that is only able to stay there, where the active zone is here next to the activation um, at the surface. So more branches are formed here, so it's like new material that constantly adds at the membrane. Right, so um, how can we um, understand the, the elastic properties? So what we did um, now a while ago is take a bead this time instead of a fiber, um, coat it with the activator of actin polymerization, so this branch network. So new monomers are uh, grow, I mean, uh, attached at the surface, so it needs to push again 
against the already existing layer. And then if you, if you look at the, this, the second layer that inserts here, it's, it need, needs to push the first layer then to pull on it, to extend it. And if I go uh, again and again, at the end you understand that I have a stress, a tangential stress here at the outer layer, and then it will break open. This is what we see here. You see the growth of this actin network, and then at some point, um, well in fact it's random, we studied this in detail, um, uh, it breaks open and then it, it opens up. And then the next step is that you have a, what we call a comet that is able to push the bead forward and it moves like bacteria, like endosomes at a few micrometers per minute. Right, so this experiment showed, I mean, showed that we do have elastic proper, properties here. So why do we have this branch network that uh, builds up elastic stress. So it depends on the concentration of branches. And this is a collaboration with the group of Martin Lenz in Orsay, where it shows that if we have a lot of branches, then we have entanglements. And these entanglements here, you see the stresses. So if it's red, the branches under stress. Um, if it's green, the stress is zero. Uh, if it's blue, it pushes. Um, so you see that if, if we have a lower density of branches, of course, we have less stress buildup. Right, so how do we model this? And here, we would need some mathematics to help us to go, to go further. But here are a few examples of how it was modeled. So we have modeled it as a viscous medium. Um, I'll come to that in a minute, but um, other people have modeled it as a kinetic model. So you have a kinetic model with um, capping proteins, enhancing the probability of branching at the surface, and also people have studied it under stress. So what we did, and we can't go further, is in fact use what I call a viscous elastic uh, mathematical trick, which is that, in fact, we, this is an elastic material, and um, we model it as a viscous material, because a viscous material, we know the velocity is proportional to the uh, displacement, and, and, and modeling the elastic material is too complicated for physicists. So uh, we just model it as a, as a viscous material with a viscosity eta, and then we say that the viscosity eta is the uh, elastic modulus multiplied by the characteristic time. So we need to solve it with eta, and then we divide by tau, by a characteristic time, and we get, um, we get our velocity field and all that. So in fact, the uh, time scale is on the order of minutes. So if you, in fact, if you pull on a cell, if I pull on this, um, you see it goes back. Um, if, if you look at your elbow, um, so it's a bit more viscous, right? So the, the time scale is about a minute. Uh, right, so what we do here is we reconstitute this network uh, around the liposome, so this is our scheme. Proteins are not to scale. Of course, we add ATP. What we do is have, we have the membrane that looks like the one of the cell. We put some stickers here. This is the activators of the ARP23 complex. In yellow, you have the ARP23 complex. Then you have the branches that form. Well, we have a tetramer. Don't ask me why, but we could do that with, uh, um, um, with two or, or one. Uh, with tetramers, it, it, it works better. Um, and then we have the capping protein that is able to, to, to cap the filaments. Right, so in the presence of capping proteins, so I will only talk about the presence of capping proteins, um, the shell th thickness is well defined because as I said, we have a dead zone here and the shell thickness will be defined by the time I leave the thing polymerized, right? So if I leave the thing polymerized before, it breaks the symmetry, um, so I will have a, a thicker or, or a thinner uh, shell. Right, so, um, then I think I will um, suggest three parts. I may not have time to go on to the, 
third part, but the third, uh, first part is um, I'll talk about wrinkling, how we see some wrinkling happening here. Um, so I will put you in the context of wrinkling, wrinkling in biological systems and um, how we can understand how wrinkles uh, happen in our system. So wrinkling is just like, um, if I do this, um, I have my, my muscle that, that, that pushes on my skin, and this is why I wrinkle. Um, I'll show you a few examples of this. Um, then I will show you some uh, philopodia-like and endocytic-like membrane deformations. Um, here you see the membrane is in, in pink. In purple, you have the capping protein that marks the end of the filaments. And you will, I will like, tell you how we can understand that we make tubes of membranes and spikes that look like, look like cell philopodia. And then I will, if I have time, I will tell you how actin modulates the morphology of membrane tubes. So here it was a surprise that <coughs> if we grow an actin sleeve around the membrane tube, we stabilize it. Anyway, so let's talk about uh, wrinkles. So in general, uh, wrinkles are produced when you have a stiff and a soft substrate that grow differentially. Here, if you have a stiff substrate that grows faster than the soft substrate that is underneath, then you will have something like this. If you have a soft over, over stiff and the soft grows, you will have some, something like this. And if you have soft over soft, you will have something like this. And you have ex examples here with uh, uh, polymers. Um, so this is an, a very interesting experiment here. Um, uh, so if uh, so it's a wrinkling of a pre-stressed elastomer. So imagine you make a pre-stressed elastomer. So you have an elastomer here, then you blow some oil here. So you will stress your elastomer. Here the gray thing is stress uh, because you have pushed uh, oil uh, onto it. Now you deposit a, another polymer layer here in blue, and then you release the oil. Then you wrinkle the system. But you wrinkle the system because it was in pre-stress. So here you did a pre-stress, um, you add a second layer, and you, you do this. You will see we, we, we see exactly this in our experiments. So in fact, it applies to the brain. Um, as you know, the brain is made of uh, um, uh, white matter and gray matter. Uh, you have a, an image here. And in fact, um, one property of the ne neurons that make the gray matter is that they grow faster. So for a while, people thought the, the, the shape of the, of the uh, brain is due to the growth of one single neuron that will, that will push. Well, in fact, no, it's, it's due to the growth of the whole material. So I'll show you in a minute. So if you look at uh, the brain after, uh, after 23 days, it's not wrinkled, um, but uh, from 25 days, it starts to, to wrinkle. So what uh, these experimentalists did was they took a mold of the brain at 20, 23 days, and then they grew a polymer on it um, that was swollen in water. So this is what you see. This is before it's swollen and after it's swollen. So just by swelling, the layer that is outside the brain makes it wrinkle. And then there was a mathematical model on it. So I think I, preparing this talk, I thought, why are people interested in brain and gut? Because gut is the second thing people have looked at for wrinkling. And in fact, I think it's just because we like to eat and think. <laughs> Anyway, so the, the gut is exactly the same, um, except that um, so you have a, except that you have a muscle here. So you have the muscle that keeps the gut um, cylindrical, and when when the cells grow here, it wrinkles inside the gut, and you see the wrinkles here. And because the, as you know, the, the gut is under peristaltic um, deformations, um, then you have wrinkles that develop in the uh, in the long scale. So in fact, if you take, uh, so with the muscle, you have wrinkling of the gut. If you remove the muscle, then you don't have any wrinkling, wrinkling of the gut. Right, so back to our system. 
Uh, so just to remind you that we have our membrane here and the uh, actin network that grows, we can vary the thickness. And what we do is we make it wrinkle. So we, we just by, by an osmotic shock, once we have grown the um, actin network, um, we let the water get out. So we empty the liposome, which is very cool. And then what we get, um, I'll show you in a minute, but first you need to take into account that so either we can consider it as a continuous system, or if we take the mesh size of the system, is it's on the order of uh, 30, uh, mic 30 to 50 uh, nanometers. Uh, so it's much larger than one lipid head that is about nanometric. So what we see when we do that is two behaviors. Um, so either what we call buckling, or what we call wrinkling. So you see it's different because buckling, it really looks like a ping pong ball when you push on it. So it, 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 it has only one, one uh, difference in shape, one, one shape change, whereas wrinkling is really um, a sort of undulation around it. So what, um, what differs in both cases is in fact the thickness of the, of the shell. Here you have the thickness of the shell, H0, and here the frequency of, of deformed liposomes. You see that at, at low thickness you see lots of buckling, at high thickness you see lots of wrinkling. So how do we go from one to the other? In fact, buckling is quite well characterized. Um, so it's the bending of a, of a sheet. And um, so, in fact, the, uh, the uh, energy, um, well, in fact, what's important is that you, in buckling, you have the mirror shape here of the perfect sphere. So every, every elastic energy uh, is consumed here on this uh, sort of uh, ridge. And so by counting this elastic energy here at the ridge, you just get the uh, relationship between um, the um, curvature, the maximal curvature that you have here, uh, as a function of the decrease in volume, the thickness, and the radius of the sphere. So this is for one single thin sheet. Now if I look at wrinkling, wrinkling is on a thicker shell. And what happens here is that you have a wavelength that is dependent on the uh, membrane bending rigidity and the elastic modulus of the, of the network. And in fact, this um, length scale here, I mean this uh, um, uh, regular length scale is um, directly uh, related to kappa and E. So in fact, wrinkling can be, can be modeled by um, an undulation here around the, around the sphere. So now, um, yeah, so this length scale, um, taking our, um, our uh, experimental value measured from other experiments, uh, we find that it's 350 nanometers. And what happens in between? In between, we have a little bit of both. Uh, so we have a little bit of, of, of uh, deformation of the elastic shell. So I should stress here that everything happens on a length scale that is on the order of lambda, which means that this layer doesn't, doesn't deform much, but every, all the deformation is next to the membrane. Right, so um, to, to sum up, if we uh, consider a shape here, an undulation, uh, U cosine QX. Um, so if uh, QH0 is very small compared to one, we have a very thin shell and we know how to derive the elastic energy of buckling. Uh, now if we have a thick shell, we know how to derive the elastic energy of wrinkling. This is um, knowledge, uh, this is, um, literature. And now for all QH0, how do we do this? Um, and this is where mathematics um, came in. So this is the elastic energy that is valid for this and for, for this limit and for this limit. There's no physics in it, just mathematics. And um, it does work. So we could derive just by fitting our data with this formula, we could derive uh, the transition between buckling and wrinkling. So one very interesting thing is that we find uh, a critical thickness that should be lambda, 
but it's not lambda, because if you remember well, we're under pre-stress here. I told you when we grow the actin shell around a spherical, uh, in spherical geometry, um, we, we, we build up stress inside the other layer. So we are exactly in the case I was um, presenting before, where we do have a pre-stress here, so the wrinkling scale is higher than the predicted one without pre-stress. Right, so uh, to conclude on this part, um, so I showed you that um, if we have a shell here that we put under um, an osmotic shock because of the membrane, so we have two behaviors, either buckling or wrinkling. And in fact, this is a very general uh, behavior in biology. Um, this applies to pollen grains, and this applies to, I, I showed you, to, to the development of the gut. Maybe we can uh, put the light down like this. No, okay, well, can you see it correctly? Very dark. Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so we can see buckling and the wrinkling here. Right, so I will go to the second part. Um, thank you, I think that's fine. And um, so if you look carefully on these experiments here, if you have good eyes, uh, you can see th some membrane tubes here. So I'll show, show, show them to you more clearly here. So what we see is um, inside the network, we see membrane tubes. So these membrane tubes are pulled uh, when the uh, actin network grows. So this is um, um, here an image, same, same liposome, image by uh, phase contrast, membrane, actin, and overlay. You see that the membrane, you see very thin tubes um, around the, the liposome here. And they are sort of uh, taken inside the uh, network. Uh, so if we, of course we checked that these tubes were due to actin polymerization. So what we did is actin photo damage. So just we shine a lot of light and um, it destroys the actin. And you see that if we destroy the actin, we recover uh, a, a sort of a smooth shape of the membrane, right? So these tubes are really pulled during actin polymerization. So in fact, I presented this, this work at a conference, at the biophysics conference in Roscoff well, there were lots of people from the traffic, lots of biologists from the traffic. And you know, um, when for endosome development, I mean, endosome formation, um, there's a dogma that says that you have curvature proteins that initiate a curvature, and this is how endocytosis proceeds. And at this uh, conference, there was um, Andrea Pico, who was a postdoc at EMBL, working, um, he's also on this paper here. Um, who said that, in fact, they were just discovering that um, these code proteins assembled after the actin was uh, starting to polymerize. So, in fact, what they were able to show is exactly what we saw, is that um, in cells, not in, in in vitro systems like us, but um, in fact, the uh, code proteins are more of a platform, a, a flat platform that uh, recruits um, uh, um, activators of actin polymerization. So in fact, act actin polymerization precedes code protein formation, code protein assembly. So one interesting thing is that there was a, a work uh, from, um, I mean, using lipidomics and proteomics. Um, what these people did, it's uh, the team of Bernard Oflak in Dresden. They took um, lipids, reconstituted lipids, so pure lipids, and they put them in cell extracts. And what they see really looks like what we see. Uh, you see these tubes that, that grow. And in, in this paper, when you read this paper, there are two possibilities. One is that these lipids and some proteins that are recruited um, uh, generate curvature. And the other hypothesis is that it may be the actin network that 
that pulls these tubes. And in fact, as you may appreciate, it really resembles our experiments. So we'll forget about these spikes for the moment. Uh, but you see these tubes, they already resemble them. So um, a few months ago, people from the, um, uh, I mean, biologists working on myopathies came to see me and say, okay, well, we saw your paper. Uh, we think in myopathies, um, uh, we do have some tube, membrane tube forming and we would like to add our protein uh, in your uh, mixture. And I said, yes, let's write a grant. And the report of the grant came and it's not clear why the applicants focus on the actin machinery that we published a year ago, and do not address other relevant proteins, including membrane tubulated protein, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we're here uh, in a dogma, and um, maybe I could call it counter counterintuitivity, as you said this morning. But I think this is where physics and, and mathematics can, can, can come and, and just um, uh, close the debate on which dogma is, is the good one. Anyway, so coming from physics, we thought because it's well known that the force to pull a membrane tube is proportional to the square root of the membrane tension and bending stiffness, uh, we can change the membrane tension very easily. We can, uh, again, uh, by an osmotic shock. So we thought if we decrease membrane tension, we will decrease the force for pulling a tube and we will have more tubes. And this is not what happened. What we found was more spikes. So we found this um, inward, this, this time inward deformations of the membrane when we lower the membrane tension. So it was a big surprise. Um, and uh, then we counted them and we found that um, um, in, uh, so we have the same amount of tubes if we don't deflate the liposomes or if we deflate the liposomes, but uh, we don't have the same amount of spikes. We have more spikes, as I said, more of these deformations uh, when we deflate the liposomes. So uh, here are two uh, 3D images of them. You see the spikes here pointing inwards, um, and you see some tubes here. Here's the same, you see a spike and you see some tubes, so they coexist um, at high tension. Right, so if we look at the spikes now in detail, so we did an experiment where we start with, um, we start with red actin and then we add green actin. So you see um, the uh, red actin is inside here and the green actin is, outside, is on, the, on the edges, so it means that everything grows inside. It's really a, um, a conical shape that grows by actin growth. So it's not uh, um, like uh, classical philopodia that are made of parallel filaments. We don't have new actin growing from the tip, but we have actin growing from the sides. And in fact, by um, using this uh, uh, viscous elastic trick, we were able to, um, to predict that um, under a certain membrane tension, that's this uh, here, so we will have these spikes. So what we think is that our spikes look more like um, what's called dendritic philopodia that are used for neurons to make connection uh, between cells. So if you look carefully, um, again with this um, two uh, color experiment, you see that in fact actin grows, new actin grows also on the sides of the tubes. So what we think is that we do have a pulling force here at the tip of the tube, but we still have actin polarization at the sides. And in fact, the tube grows very slowly because it's always taken by some uh, attachment um, uh, during the growth. Right, so we were able with our simplistic uh, viscous, uh, viscous elastic uh, mathematical model to uh, make a prediction diagram with, where we have the mesh size. So we could change the mesh size by changing the uh, mixture of proteins and the membrane tension. And you see that at high membrane tension, we have no tubes and no spikes. And if we decrease membrane tension, we find tubes and no spike or tubes and spikes. So, and, and if we uh, decrease the if we increase the mesh size, which means that we decrease the young, I mean the uh, elastic modulus, then we um, can uh, go through these uh, these phases here. 
right? So um, as a conclusion, uh, uh, we can say that uh, the uh, endocy endocytic ma machinery of actin polymerization is very robust because it doesn't depend on the membrane tension, whereas filopodia formation depends on membrane tension. Right. I do have time. Yeah, so um, I'll have time for, for this part. So now, um, this part was motivated by traffic again. So was motivated by this paper where, um, so when other cyto cytosis um, uh, deforms a membrane, then membrane tubes are taken by microtubules. My so motors pull on the, on the tube, and this is what you see here. Um, there's a microtubule uh, underneath here. And then it breaks into pieces because we know that trafficking occurs by small uh, vesicles. So uh, fission seems to depend on actin reorganization. So we said, um, well, let's uh, mimic it, mimic this. So what we did was take a liposome that we slightly adhere on a substrate, and we pull with it with a bead. We pull a membrane tube. It's a very tricky experiment. Then we add the activator of actin polymerization on the tube. Then then we add actin monomers. Of course, we have all the mixture inside, and then we grow a sleeve of actin. So I should say here, uh, compared to Shaoki Mishba's um, talk this morning, I don't have depolymerization, right? I simplified the system with purified protein. I only have polymerization. And what I do here, I mean, what, what we do here is that we remo remo remove the micropipette once we have grown our sleeve here. So in fact, the surprise, so then we can do the work of the microtubule, like pull on the, on, on the bead. Well, in fact, what we do is we, we, back, we go backward with the, with the cover slip. And what we could see is that the, the uh, presence of the actin sleeve, in fact, stabilizes the tube. So it was a surprise because we were expecting it to cut the tube into pieces. And so we could, um, again, measure the elastic properties of this. So uh, when it escapes from the bead, we could um, uh, model it. So when you have a lot of actin, you have um, a network under stress. So it, it's able to, it's cohesive, and it's able to hold the uh, membrane tube. And when you have less entanglement, then you have something that is, um, that, that is not very stable. So from there, we could derive the um, elastic modulus of the sleeve and, in fact, predict that we had 10 meshes. So if you remember, the mesh work, it's a mesh work with a characteristic mesh size of uh, I mean, uh, 40 nanometers. So with 10 meshes, so with a network of 10 meshes, we're able to hold a membrane tube. Um, so if we pull now on it, um, what you see is that, uh, so here is the, so this is before we pull on it, so here you see the membrane, here you see the actin sleeve, and now we pull on it, what you see is that the actin doesn't cover, so in fact there is new, a new membrane forming here when you pull new membrane coming from the liposome, and you see that the, the uh, thickness of the membrane tube here is smaller. You see the fluorescence is lower here than here. So again, if we, it's very stable because if we pull on it, it doesn't break. It just remains of the same um, radius underneath the actin sleeve and just decreases its radius um, where the actin sleeve is not pulled. So the, actin, the conclusion is that the actin sleeve maintains the tube with a network of less than 10 meshes. So here we have a little less than 10 meshes. So we could predict that uh, from four to 10, uh, we have this mechanism. Over 10 meshes, we lose uh, the tube that remains held by the, by the sleeve, and below, we still, below four meshes, we just have a naked tube. So we could also look at the relaxation. Here it's a relaxation over time. So you see that um, at the beginning, so it's, it's difficult to see, but you see here um, the fluorescence is high, 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 and it decreases. So after, here you have the force as a function of time. Here the radius as a function of time. You see that it re-equilibrates 
uh, after 100 seconds. Right, so I'm done with this unless you have questions. Of just two slides of perspective. Okay, I, maybe I finish. And... Right, so some perspective since um, I don't want to dig into the dogma of uh, uh, tubulation. So we started uh, three years ago a new project on how the actin is pulling on the nucleus. So I, I, I ignored the nucleus until now. And in fact, the nucleus is here, you know, there are two membranes separating the nucleus from the cytoplasm. Here in the cytoplasm, you, are, you have actin filaments that, that we had some integrins uh, in other talks. Here you have the, in, the integrins that, that uh, help the cell on the extracellular matrix. So imagine you pull on there, you pull on the extracellular matrix, you will pull on the integrin that will pull on the actin that will pull on the nucleus. And the question is, what happens here? But the first thing is what happens here. So we, we know this link, there's a, it's called the link complex, in fact, um, that uh, binds the uh, lamens. So these are polymers, the lamens. Here you have the chromatin. So the lamens are bound through this uh, complex protein to the actin filaments. And the question is, how does this nesprin protein behave when the uh, system is under stress? So what we did was um, prepare a protein. So these nest prints are very, very long. So they are very, very difficult to study. But what we did was add a fluorophore here on the end of the nest print that binds to the actin filaments. And, um, and then we marked the lamins with another fluorophore. So we were able to see the lamin distribution compared to the nest print distribution. Um, and Aude Bastistella is the magician who, who did this markage. Um, and in fact, um, we put this in a migration device because in fact, uh, so when cancer cells spread in the body, they need to go into very small spaces and what is limiting is the nucleus because the nucleus is stiffer than the rest of the cell. So um, we make holes that are smaller than the nucleus and what you see here, here is the nest print is marked. When the, so the cell is all around here and here you see the nucleus, the cell is around, around here and what you see is that it pulls on the nucleus through the actin and through the nest prints. Here you have the space, the narrow space, so um, here you, you have a scheme of what happens and you see that when it crawls, it's pulled by the actin through the nest prints. This is in a, what we call a migration device. If now we aspirate the cell, I mean the nucleus inside the cell, through a micropipette aspiration device, what we show is, what we see is that the nest print is at the edges here, is on the sides. So uh, what we have here is a, an active process that positions the nest print at the front of the migration and a passive process, although the experimentalist is more active, the passive process that positions the nest print on the sides of the channel here. So we would like to address how this active process is uh, organized. Um, Right, so I will finish here and um, thank the people who did the work. So the team is co-headed by Julie Plastino, who is a um, CNRS research director. She's a biochemist, but she is becoming a biophysicist, and I am a physicist becoming a biophysicist. Um, the um, Karine Gevorkian is also in the team. Uh, the two PhD students who were absolutely stellar are uh, Camille Simon and Antoine Allard. Uh, we collaborate with Clément Campillot. And I would like to thank espe especially uh, André Kosmanji who opened my eyes on wrinkling last summer. Thank you very much. <laughs>